Well, howdy, y'all. Hope everybody had a great week so far. Um, I uh, need someone to open in prayer. Gordon, would you mind opening us in prayer, please? Thanks, Gordon. Uh, next week, we will go do a verse-by-verse to break down the entire passage we've been looking at. But uh, tonight, we're going to look at a few, uh, a few other things that kind of need to be addressed. I uh, hope, hope you guys all remember that we have a ministry meeting coming up on uh, July 2nd. It'll be at 6 o'clock uh, in the evening, obviously. I'm not going to be here at 6 in the morning. That's a terrible time to have a meeting. <laughs> so please, please, please mark it on your calendars to be there. The thing about ongoing conflicts, um, when, when, when you're done with conflicts with people and with situations and stuff, um, whether we're talking about a person being in sin or whether we're talking about a person just irritating you or just a life irritant in general, conflicts have a way of just kind of building up upon each other where they just get to be like a weight. And if you notice, there will be one or two big ones that hit you, you know, and then there's just going to be a whole bunch of little smaller ones. But when you're in the middle of it and you're irritated, you're going to notice that they all seem like mountains. And as they build up, you're going to hold on to all of them and get more and more frustrated. And you're going to say this, there's nothing I can do about any of this. Uh, and that's why it's important that we follow that three-step approach. We're going to look at it one more time uh, today before we get going. So not always should we conf- confront a conflict, but neither should we always run and uh, avoid it either. There's there's different different things we got to do at different times. Sometimes we uh, hit it fa- hit it in the face. Sometimes we just kind of sidestep it. And the problem is is that sometimes you forget to adapt to where you are. You'll be at work and you have to hit problems you know head on, and then you go home and you try to hit problems head on, and it causes problems with your spouse or your kids. <laughs> it's one of those things you gotta kind of be flexible. So if you remember last week, we, we looked at the three-step approach to dealing with your conflicts. Um, it was embrace it, resolve it, and then use it. So an, uh, an example of embracing would be when there's a difference of opinion. You have to just embrace that. You're not going to see eye to eye about stuff. That's all right. The second step was resolve it. Um, this would be like uh, if you have a have a company or something like that. Uh, when you have staff problems, or if you're married, it would be marital conflicts. Um, resolving conflict doesn't always mean right now. It means we're working towards it. So, uh, for especially for those of you who are married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Without me even having to say too much about it, sometimes there's conflict that's just not resolved overnight. You 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 handle it over a period of time, and that's all right. Um, sometimes we get a little bit antsy and kind of worked up, and then we say, this has to be resolved right now. <laughs> I'm tired of dealing with it. And uh, that's just unrealistic. You're just going to stress yourself out trying to resolve it real quick. Even when you're dealing with somebody who's caught in sin and you're trying to restore them to the church, even when that happens, very rarely is they going to just like, you go and talk to them, they're like, hey, you're right, and they just repent and they never struggle with it ever again. That's not going to happen. It just, it's just not. You're going to talk to them. It's going to be a little bit of good and a little bit of bad. It's going to be some, probably somebody's going to lose their temper somewhere in there. And then over the course of time, it's going to, you know, progress. The problem is, is that we live in a society that's very quick paced. Um, So we can do stuff like text and and stuff and it's instantaneous. And it sometimes makes it where we go faster than our brains can actually (laughs) handle the issue and that's a bad thing so then the third step was uh was, was using it and we kind of cut off last week and i just wanted to run through a, a quick a couple quick ideas of how you could use a conflict first off through life tension through that life conflicts i learn so learning would be one thing you can do with with conflict oh there's nothing i can do from this bad situation i'm in maybe or maybe you can learn from it um, another thing you can do is you can change how you do something so you don't keep doing it the wrong way over and over again. Let's say, for instance, you uh, co-sign on a loan. The Bible says, hey, you probably shouldn't co-sign on loans in the book of Proverbs. Let's say you do it anyways, um, and you get stuck in a really bad situation financially. Well, now this discomfort that you're, ha- that you're uh, enduring is helping you to learn <laughs> how to change 
Um, another thing that conflict does is it help, helps me to love others, right? So, okay, I got diagnosed with colitis, and it's like, hey, this isn't fun. I was kind of hoping that God was just going to gonna heal me, and that would be the end of that. And uh, he didn't. And uh, so instead I had to deal with it. Well, that, that life tension, that conflict there, uh, became a battle of the wills between God's will and my will. See, I wanted to be comfortable. I wanted the problem to go away. God <laughs> had something else. And so because he led me through this valley of despair, um, which, which, by the way, have you noticed that the majority of times that you really learn something about God and he really takes you to a new, new level of, of faith or a new level of worshiping him, it's because you went through a dark valley. Have you ever noticed that? So don't get too discouraged. It's just God's way of getting you where you need to go. Uh, but with that, with my colitis, I learned, first off, I learned how to manage stress, how to deal with other people who are stressed. I learned how to take care of things, how to reflect on burnout. <laughs> I learned uh, the patience as other people are dealing with stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, before I had colitis, when somebody dealt with something, I kind of expected them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get on with it. Well, ever since I got colitis, it's a little bit different. <laughs> it's like, well, maybe I need to give other people more patience about this. And I learned uh, to give grace to those who are sick and dying. You know when people are severely sick, they say and do stupid things? Did you know that? Yeah. I didn't know that when I was a kid. I have learned that. <laughs> and so having colitis is one thing that has taught me that. And these are things that God's been able to teach me in uncomfortable situations. Maybe you can learn in conflict, you can learn motivation for policy changes, right? You're, you're dealing with people and you're like, hey, this, this is a poor way of doing this. This is causing more harm than good. Maybe you can learn maturity in your heart or in your mind, a closer walk with God, motivation for excellence. Um, there's a story that I read, by once again, by Sam Chan. I'm not trying to only quote him, but um, I think it's relevant. He was doing this board meeting, and there were these two board members that they just did not get along at all. They, they, just, they despised each other. And, you know, they, they'd vote against each other just because they didn't like each other. And, and you know, they were always always in conflict, making it where the whole board meeting was was, like, inadvertently affected by this huge elephant in the room. And uh, eventually he just said this. He said, look, I don't know what's going on with you guys, but it's progressing. It, it's stopping us from t talking about the business we need to talk about. So I'm going to go out. We're going to go out. You two are going to stay here. You, ha you can either talk it out and figure out whatever's going on here, or don't come back tomorrow. And that's just what we're going to have to do because we, we, we can't keep going on like this. So they talked it out, and it, it was able to resolve itself. Um, but... Only by dealing with that conflict were they able to have a stronger board. Another thing, now this is something that I think is the most valuable thing I've ever learned from life's sufferings, and that's this. You learn to find opportunities. Before, you might have only seen closed doors, but you learn to find opportunities. And... Uh, when you get sick, you're going to say something like this. Oh, there's just so much. I, I, I just can't do anything. And that's not really true. Um, you just have to let your sickness open your eyes to a different kind of ministry. Maybe you're used to doing physical things, and, and then you, know, you get some kind of problem with your muscles develop, or you can't carry heavy things anymore. Well, then you have to find some other way that you can serve. Even death, as a Christian, even death ha is an opportunity to change our schedule and make time for those who are important, right? Well, we go through our life and everything's fine, and then somebody dies that we're close to, and we're like, "Oh, I should re I should reprioritize my time." F any failures that you go through, they're not the end of the road. It's just opportunity to change your tactics. So, what we're going to look at tonight is we're going to look at uh, verse seventeen b very specifically, and as we as we get ready to look at that. Um, of this passage. We're going to read the whole passage, and then we're going to go back and read verse 17. Before we get there, I want to ask a question, and I want to see what you guys had to say about this. What do you do in your own life when you can't resolve conflict with a person? You're, you're having a fight with somebody. You tried working it out. It didn't work. Whatever it is. You, maybe you tried talking with them. Maybe you tried uh, getting a mediator. I don't know. You tried something. It didn't work. What do you do? There's no right or wrong answers. It's more of what do you do? 
ignore it? And does that work well or not well? Or Yeah, okay, okay. ignore it. Depends on the person, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so then what do you do if it's something you can't walk away from? <laughs> and you can't smack it away. <laughs> What did you say, Jason? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Okay, so any, any other ideas? You cannot, you cannot resolve this. What's your next step? Grace? Okay, she said if she leaves it, she feels like she gets bitter. So what she does is she tries to apologize and just kind of leaves, it, leaves the ball in their court. What do you do, uh, though, following up on that then? What do you do if you feel like you didn't do anything wrong? Do you still apologize? Yeah. I'm sorry that you're just so stupid that you think I did something wrong. <laughs> Is that basically what you're saying? <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard what she said, but she said about how she um, tries to apologize anyways, even if she doesn't think that she did anything wrong, because af as she thinks about it more, she kind of realizes, hey, maybe I did. So. Um, okay, was there anything else somebody wanted to say? Don't want to cut anybody off. We're all good? Okay. So we're going to read through Matthew 18, 15 through 20, and then we're going to really zoom in on verse 18 or 17. 17, sorry. Verse 17, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, can I get, uh, Darla, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be on that trip, so can you read the first slide there? And Gracie, you've never read one of these slides. Can you read one of them? Okay, and can I have one more? Anybody? Shane, go ahead. So why we've been reading this through every single week is I want you guys to get an idea of the passage. Before you do a Bible study of any sort, you need to read the passage itself over and over and over again. So I'm just trying to help us kind of internalize some of what it's saying. Uh, Matthew 18:17b. We just let's focus on this one part of this one verse. It says, "If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you." So next week we'll go verse by verse, and what is it really talking about there? We're not going to look at that tonight. What we're looking at tonight is the idea of let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector. What, what does that even mean? So um, I think it's important to once again reiterate. We're talking more generally about how life conflicts, which can be you don't like somebody, it can be somebody's in sin, it can be you're going through a hard situation. But this verse is specifically talking about sin, not conflict generally. Okay, There's a very big difference there. And the reason why I bring that up is because sometimes people uh, try and apply this verse to every single time that they're in conflict with somebody, and that's just not going to work. This is specifically talking about there is someone in the church who is sinning. Okay? So, <clears throat> it says, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector. What in the world does that mean? Well, first off, this passage is talking about something called excommunication. For those of you who have been in the church for a while, you know what that word means. If you haven't been in the church for a while, don't worry about it. It basically means uh, that they are no longer welcome around these here parts. Okay, um, It's more common in things like uh, Catholic churches or Orthodox, uh, where you you know have them you know dismissed from the assembly. Uh, you don't hear it used too much in Protestant churches. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, and so the idea that the Jews had is they had like this whole cultural tie, and that happened at the synagogue. So your synagogue wasn't just where you went to a service. It was where you had life. They would um, have different ceremonies there. They would do their rituals there. They would do their religious things there, yes. But they also did things kind of, uh, kind of like school. It was kind of like school. 
Um, and so they had a lot of different things. And to go to the synagogue was to be a Jew. And to be a Jew was to go to the synagogue. It was part of you. Uh, it would kind of be like being an American and celebrating July 4th. I mean, it's just something that we do. Like, it's just, you know. Um, and uh, so so it's it's really, you know, tied in with that. And so what he's saying here is, he's ta- remember, he's talking to Jews. This is before the church was officially started. And he's talking about the way that when there is someone in sin, you don't let it pollute the community. You kick them out of the community. So that would be to basically lose your Jewishness. So a way he could say that would be, be like a Gentile and a tax collector. You are ostracizing them from the fellowship, from the community. Um, if we want to use modern terms, it would be you are no longer a member at the church. Okay, maybe that would be near enough. So there's a few things to highlight from this. First off, this is only for those in the church. It's not for the world. You don't throw people away or, you know, dust your, dust your was it, um, shake the dust off your shoes or, you know, wipe your hands off or anything. He's not talking about, he's not talking about this for the world. You're going to deal with people in the world who are irritating. You're going to witness somebody and they make fun of you and spit in your face. And you're going to find a lot of times that you have to still deal with it. Great example. You go to work, you witness to a coworker, they make fun of you, you still have to work with them <laughs> the next day and the next day and the next day and so on and so on until you die. And it's one of those things that's very frustrating. So it's like, it's easy to say this. Well, you know, I did my duty, my duty, so I'm just I'm done. Like, I don't have to do anything else. It's like whenever, you, whenever, um, whenever we have conflict and we, and we forgive somebody, right? Well, I did everything I could to forgive, so now I'm clear. I don't have to do anything else. Well, until they're ready, and then you have to do something else. You know what I mean? You're under conflict. You ask them to forgive you. They say no. And so you wait until they are ready to, forg- to forgive you, and then you try again. What we do, though, is we say, well, I tried before, and we just kind of leave it alone. And that's definitely not the idea. So this is only for the church, not for the world. He's not saying you should stop witnessing to somebody because they're a pain. He's not saying any of that. He's talking about the church. Because um, I know there's a lot of people who tried to, who, who've tried to apply this to their families. <laughs> well, I really don't like my brother. <laughs> I really don't like him. And uh, so, hey, I'm doing what the passage here says. It's talking about the body, the body of Christ, the church, okay? Um, then the second thing I want to point out is that this is only after severe immorality as a last resort. It's not something you should just go around kicking people out of the church left and right. <laughs> Definitely no. It, it is not something where it's like, well, um, they're doing something wrong, or at least something that I think is wrong, so out they go. It's not the first step. It's like spanking your kids, right? Spankings aren't the first step you do. You don't, oh, your, your kid accidentally did something, well, smack him to, pe-. you know, it, 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 it's not how you do things. And uh, it's it's after a severe immorality. We're talking about, a large sin they are refusing to turn from. We're not talking about, well, this person offended me. We're not talking about, I don't like the way this person is. We're not talking about that. There's going to be people that you don't like in the church, and that's okay. I mean, you don't have to like everybody. We talked about this already. We're talking about somebody is sinning. Uh, the, le- the last thing I want to point out from this is that God, and I think this verse very clearly shows us, God takes it very seriously that we address sin in ourselves and in each other. There is a more modern Christian, Christian, I but use that word loosely, uh, movement that basically sin isn't that big of a deal. And, you know, it's not about us being saved from our sin. It's more about us finding our oneness with God. And, you know, we're basically just like, hooray. And there's no real cost associated with it. Jesus' death did nothing except to awaken my inner spark of the divine. And it's like, that's that's not Christianity. That's <laughs> No, we are, we are sinners, and we are in need of a Savior, and th- that's kind of the heart of Christianity. And uh, this verse shows us that, yes, God is very concerned about sin in us and in each other. And God doesn't want sin left to fester. He doesn't want us to be left in our bitterness or our addictions or our, you know, fill in the blank, whatever. He doesn't want us to stay there. There's a saying, I don't know who said it, maybe, uh, maybe Charles Stanley. God takes us, no, I don't think it's Charles Stanley. He takes us wherever we are, but he doesn't leave us wherever we are. 
And I think that that's a perfect way to kind of summarize what's going on here. So we're talking about people who are Christians, not barely saved, right? We're not meeting people at the door and giving them a list. And uh, we're talking about a serious sin, not something where they're just not, they're just rubbing you the wrong way. And uh, so God takes it seriously. We're obeying him when we address it. We, we we're living for him. We're trying to do that. We're trying to change our life. And uh, conflict is, is part of our Christian life because we, uh, we have to address sin in ourselves and each other. We have to, this is something that, that's kind of a big deal. Um, <clears throat> so a good example of this would be like if there was somebody here who was having an affair. That would be something that was a great example. That kind of stuff can't be left unchecked in the church. And obviously we're in conflict with our own earthly desires too. There's a war inside of each of us. So there was a, there was a woman, there was a church that I was serving at. And um, in the church there was this woman who got involved uh, in an affair. She started to cheat on her husband. And she ended up leaving the church um, because she didn't want to quit the affair. She wanted to be in sin. She wanted that. And um, it was progressing. It started out as just one-on-one kind of thing, but it very quickly was evolving to in, in, to include the church leadership too. Um, it was kind of escalating very quickly. And uh, so she kind of left because she saw where things were going. And um, uh, I remember I, I, I pulled her aside. I, I, I told her one day because I saw it was escalating too, and I knew she was starting to have meetings with you know, the pastor and stuff. So I, I told her, I said, look, if you're sleeping with this guy, don't don't tell me, okay? Just just don't come to practice. She was on the worship team. I said, just don't come to practice. Stop singing on the worship team. Step down. I'm not going to kick you off. You just step down. Do it, the, do it the good way. And you can tell people you step down for whatever reason you want. I, I just don't want that on the stage. And because I already knew... It was escalating with the church leadership. So I already knew there was going to be some situations going on there with reprimands and stuff like that. I just wanted to hand it over to the church leadership, if you see what I'm saying. And so I, I told her that. And, uh, well, so she did. Yeah, but then the story that she told it differed a little bit from the facts. It turns out that uh, that I'm a jerk. <laughs> Whoever would have thought, huh? But anyways, and uh, so it didn't really work how I hoped it would. Um, but what happened when she left was there were people who tried to still be buddies with her in the church. They still tried to hang out with her and stuff. And um, they were trying to teach and treat her like, like she was still part of the body. And what happened, and I didn't even know this would happen, but it does. The attitude, Her attitude rubbed off on them because they weren't willing to break their relationship. They thought, oh, no, I need to be loving to her. I need to still include her so that way she'll turn from her sin. She already knew Christ. She was a strong Christian of more than 10 years who fell into a sin and would not accept uh, being corrected. This is a great example of when you break things off. And the problem is, is to us, that sounds very harsh, and we're not willing to accept it and to face that. And so rather than following God's law, God's word, we say, it's fine. It's not that big of a deal. And so then we get polluted by the sin of another person. Um, can I have somebody read 1 Corinthians 5.11? So Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, and in it he had told them not to hang out with people in the church who were sinning. And they thought that he was saying, don't hang out with anybody who sins. And so then he writes again, and he says, okay, um, no, no, no. What I was writing to you about was I told you not to, not to associate with, with somebody who claims to be a Christian and is still living this life. A big, big difference there. Um, so, you know, obviously he's not talking about messing up. Everybody messes up, right? Especially somebody who's new to the faith. There's like this, this period there when you first get saved when you still do some stupid stuff, right? Somebody who's been saved a, a year. They might still be sleeping around. 
somebody who's saved for, you know, two years. They might still be doing drugs off and on. This isn't something you can expect every single time for somebody who's saved to always walk away from every single sin, right? I mean, look at yourself. Do you see yourself as sinless? Be, be, be honest there. Like, no, of course not. There's things that you still mess up on. You've been saved for years. So when there's somebody who, who comes into the body, it's going to take them a while. Well, that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about people who are messing up. He's talking about those people who are living in sin, and they're not even trying. They're not even trying. Like the story that I told you of that woman. No, I'm going to have this affair. That's just how it is. A perfect example. So then in 2 Thessalonians uh, 3, 6, and uh, Todd, would you mind reading that, please? Uh, the reason why the first word isn't capitalized there, I could see eyeballing it there. Uh, it was because I copied and pasted it, and when it went over, it kept the lowercase. And so, anyways, uh, okay. So in this one, it says this word here to keep away from every brother or sister who is idle. So it, the context of Second Thessalonians three is it's talking about the way that people are not contributing, but yet they still want to be provided for. Uh, maybe a modern day example would be um, kind of like the welfare kind of thing. You know, I don't really want to work for what I eat, but I want everybody else to provide it for me. Kind of that mentality. And, you know, once again, it, that's okay for the world. The world can do that. They, they can live by that system. But as we get saved, there has to be a point where God invades how we do our finances. You know what I mean? When, when we're not a Christian, it doesn't really matter whether we spend our money on porn or on drugs or whatever, because we're not saved. Like, it doesn't matter which sins we're doing, we're still going to hell. But then when we get saved, that's, that's the difference. And now we're expected to do something different. So Paul's talking about how, and this is still applies to today, if you don't work, you shouldn't be eating. And it, it, it's, he said that in 2 Thessalonians, right after this verse, it still applies to today. As Christians, we need to be responsible, we need to be mature. Yes, all those things. But that still brings us to the idea of what the word idle means. So a rough idea of the word could be translated disorderly or, or unruly. Disorderly un, or unruly. I think that's, that, that's a good uh, translation of that word. It, it really has a, has a there's all an idea there. But it, it's basically the whole give me mindset. And that mindset is not biblical. We're not takers as Christians. We are givers. It's kind of like one of the foundational things of, of Christianity. That takes us to uh, Proverbs 22, 20, 22, 24, which says, Don't make friends with an angry person, and don't be a companion of a hot-tempered one. And if we hop ahead to 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty four, it says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. You, bec excuse me, you become who you are like. And you are what you eat, so don't eat somebody who's angry because then you'll become angry. And it's a joke. So uh, another way you could say that was uh, maybe don't hang around with problem makers. Um, the, 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 those who, who kind of um, cause a problem and they leave and they're in a huff and a puff and they're over there bad-mouthing the church and all the different stuff. Probably not the greatest thing to, you know, to hang out with them. I'm not talking about people who leave the church and then, you know, they're still like, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who leave the church like on bad terms. You know what I mean? They go out yelling and screaming. And we, we had this one woman, we had to finally get a restraining order because she wasn't all, I, I don't know. It was, it was something. I don't even know exactly all that the, there was. But um, she would come and uh, she had this one leg. And it was like the super creepiest thing because you'd hear her coming down the hallway. Like on a horror movie, I was just waiting for like the scratching on the door or something. But uh, so you know, she she comes and she would sit there for you know 15 minutes or something, and then she would just freak out. She'd start cussing out the pastor and you know making a big scene in the middle of the Bible series. Like, 
<sighs> and then you'd ask her to leave, and she made it a whole ordeal. And then she'd, you know, accuse you of something like, oh, that pastor, he raped me, he touched me. And it's just like, whoa, we've got cameras, guys. Hold on, everybody, calm down. We've got cameras. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things. We're just, ah. Finally, we had to get the police involved, and we had to get a, get a restraining order. It, it was terrible. It was All of it was awkward and terrible. But what I'm saying is problem makers. That's, I tell you that awkward story to get to the point of problem makers. Uh, and so it will pollute you, and it will condone them. That's a twofold promise of what happens when you associate with these problem people. First off, it condones them. It makes them feel like, I didn't do anything wrong. It's them who's wrong. My word against them, and I know I'm right, so they must be wrong. That doesn't do anything to rectify them to the church. The second thing is it pollutes you. You become like the people who you hang around with. Find people who gossip, hang around them. You're going to gossip. Find people who always complain about everything. Hang around them, then you will complain. It's one of those things, that's, it's an irrefutable fact of life. It's just the way that it is. You become like who you hang around with. And... Um, So we're going to look at two questions, and then we're going, to, we're going to be done. The first question is, uh, I thought we have to be loving as Christians. And the second question is, well, I thought we weren't supposed to judge. And we're going to look at both of those. What would you guys say if somebody came up to you and said, well, how can you possibly turn your back on someone who's been in the church for years? How can you possibly do that when you claim to be loving? What would you guys say? Depends on what they did. Can you give us some more? Fair enough. Fair enough. Anybody else? Did you guys hear what she said? She said tough love where you have to let them make the mistake so you can learn from it. Okay. Danny, go ahead. So he was talking about the way that it's kind of like the love of a mother who still loves her child but still gets him in trouble. My mom used to say this thing. Um... We've been trying to say all the things that my mom used to say as like a joke since she passed. And one thing that she used to do is that every time that she answered the phone, she'd say, what's wrong? So now we're trying to remember that every time we answer the phone, we need to say, what's wrong? <laughs> um, I forgot what I was even, why I even brought that up. You were saying about how, oh, I remember. She used to, one thing she used to say when we were kids was, I love you, I just don't like you. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Anyways, back on back on track. Um, so, you know, I thought Christians were supposed to be loving. Yes, yes, absolutely, Christians are supposed to be loving. But loving doesn't mean that we can disobey God. If God to told us that we need to do a certain action, then we can love somebody even as we're doing that action. See what I mean? And the action he's talking about here in uh, Matthew is he's talking about bringing correction to somebody who's caught in sin, and they won't turn from it. That's something that God tells us to do. So, yes, we should be loving, but we also have to obey. Um, and, and we can't just have no standards. But another little point to this is that loving doesn't mean that you accept evil behavior. Loving somebody doesn't mean that you accept evil behavior. We, we live in a society nowadays where if you love somebody, quote-unquote love, it has to be a feeling. It's not an action. It's a feeling. And so for that feeling to exist, I have to completely affirm every single choice that somebody makes. That's not really based on reality. I can disagree with you, and I can still love you and disagree with you. See what I mean? Like, it's okay to have a difference of opinion. It's okay to also have um, morals. You know, so if you think something's wrong... I mean, that's, that's okay. That doesn't mean... There's this thing where when I was a kid, we, we talked about tolerance. And what it used to mean was we don't see eye to eye. We're going to accept each other still. Now what tolerance means is I have to see eye to eye with you because whatever you believe is whatever is true. And it's just, uh, it's totally different and, and weird, and it's not what the Bible teaches. So just ignore all those things that people tell you about, hey, if you really love somebody, you'll just affirm them in every way. And instead, listen to this, loving doesn't mean you accept evil behavior. Right? I mean, if I love my son, and I love my other son, and my one son is mean to that other son, 
if I love them both, I'll get the guilty one in trouble because I love the not guilty one, right? Does that kind of make sense? So I would say, yes, Christians should love even as you correct. You should love as you correct. So maybe it's more an issue of your attitude than what you're doing. I think that's a good way of saying it. Um, you don't have to be snide and condescending. So uh, then the next, uh, the second question that I want to look at. Well, I thought we weren't supposed to judge. Aren't Christians not supposed to judge? Well, uh, that's a bit of a loaded pistol. <laughs> so we're going to try and break it down in as quick in a, a simple way as we can, hopefully no longer than five minutes. Matthew 7, 1 says, do not judge so that you won't be judged. And on the surface, it sounds like, hey, you do you and let me live my own truth. And it, I can understand where people get this if you don't read the Bible. Because if you just continue on reading in the very next verse, it talks more about this. And then we get to verse 5, and it's super clear. It says in Matthew 7, 5, First take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. So what it's saying there is that you are supposed to be taking the splinter out of your brother's eye. Did you just hear that? First take the beam, which means it's a progress of action. You're doing one thing so you can go on to do another thing. Right? So if I told you, build a house, first dig the footings. Now you know that the house won't be finished when you dig the footings. You're going to know that there's something else you're going to do, right? We just accept that. But when we get to this verse, we all lose our minds. First take the beam out of wood out of your eye. He's talking about people who are hypocrites, people who only see how everybody else is wrong, but they're right. And then you will see clearly in order to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. In other words, you need to take the splinter out of your brother's eye, but you aren't in a place of doing that because you've got a huge log in your own. And then it's also worth pointing out that whenever somebody says Christians aren't supposed to judge, that statement is actually judging. That statement is judging. You are saying you're being judgmental. I am making a judgment on your behavior that you should not judge. It's self-refuting. You cannot judge because that's judgmental. But you're being judging. Not only that, but have you ever tried to not judge at all? Think about this. You go to give somebody a loan, and you don't take any consideration in their credit score, in their past, in their current reality, in their job f faithfulness, and you just give them the money. Hopefully, you don't run a business, because that's not going to work. <laughs> but if you work for the business, you make a judgment call, right? This person has defaulted on loans numerous times. This is not a person we need to loan to. Make sense? So um, so I think you could summarize this verse in Matthew 7 as don't be a jerk or a hypocrite, but discern, um, discern correctly. Be correct in your discernment. And the last thing I want to say about this is, well, let's go to Matthew 18, 15 before I say that. Remember when, you, when we read this just a little while ago, Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins... You are knowing that he's sinning by judging whether it is a sin. See what I mean? So you can't take one verse out of context that says, do not judge, when he goes on to say, before you take the log out of your eye, and then say, therefore, no Christian should ever judge about anything. And it's, that, that, that's, that's just silly. So then in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13, it says, for what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? We don't judge the world, right? We, we don't do that. We don't go on rants about homosexuals or transgenders or, you know, Democrats or whatever. We don't do that because that's the world. The world can do whatever it wants to do. We are not the police agents of the world. We are God's ambassadors to a sinful culture. Does that make sense? So in that, our job is not to judge the world. Rather, don't you judge those who are inside and the way Greek is written, it's, it's really an interesting language. You can write it in such a way where the answer is an assumed yes or an assumed no. And in the Greek, this statement, don't you judge those who are inside, is an assumed yes. So it's, it's one of those things I really, really can't get into grammar right now, but it's one of those things. God judges outsiders. He judges the world. Remove the evil person from among you instead. 
So, obviously, this does not mean nowhere in this conversation about dealing with, you know, people who are sinning in the church, does that mean that you shouldn't let sinners come to church? No. It doesn't mean that at all. There should be sinners in the church. There should be people who need and want God. That's a good thing. It's good to see, you know, the weirdos, the outcasts, the drug addicts, the transgenders, the anybody. It's, it's good to see that in church. You want to see that in church. The sign of a healthy, growing church is that there's cigarettes in the parking lot. This is a good thing. It means that you are reaching the people who need to be reached. But with that being said, we're talking more about think membership. Someone who knows better and just won't do better. Because we all mess up, right? But there's a difference between living in sin and sinning. I sin. I sinned earlier today. I'm going to sin again tomorrow. It's something that I know for sure because I know I'm not perfect. But there's a difference between that and living in sin. Let's say, for instance, I claim to be a Christian. I'm like, no, but I'm not going to stop looking at porn. And nothing you do will ever get me to stop. And I'm not going to even try to stop. That would be a good example. So are you going to have times when you fail and go back to your addiction, be it drugs or whatever? Maybe. That might happen. But a failure on your part doesn't negate the faithfulness of God. You know, you know what I'm saying? You're going to mess up, yeah, but God is going to remain faithful because you are saved by his grace and not yours. So next week we'll look at why does it take two or more for God to be there? It's a very interesting question. Something that we read just a little while ago in Matthew 18. He said, where two or more are gathered, why does it take two or more for God to be there? We'll look at that next week.